Coming up, Congress has voted out the Speaker of the House, a first in U.S. history. We learn about the players involved and what it could mean for Indigenous communities. A new intertribal resolution supports limits for oil and gas development near Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Plus, we look into a Canadian import designed to help heal boarding school wounds. We have those interviews, plus headlines ahead on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT Newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands. On the web at ILTF.org. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Amirawahopa, thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. We start today in Arizona, where the family of a missing and murdered indigenous relative is getting long-wanted answers. Last week, Trey C. James was convicted for domestic abuse and for the fatal shooting of Jamie Yazzie before a U.S. District Court in Phoenix. The 31-year-old will be sentenced in late January for the crimes. In the summer of 2019, Yazzie went missing from her community of Pinon on the Navajo Nation in Arizona. Even though a high-profile search was made, the mother of three was not found until two years later on Hopi lands in Arizona. Several of Yazi's family members and friends attended all seven days of the trial. Her attorney, Darlene Gomez, said it's unusual for cases like these to get to a trial phase and then to get to a conviction. Gomez added the U.S. Attorney's Office underscored the importance of investigating and prosecuting MMIW crimes. James was also found guilty of several acts of domestic violence against three other former partners. In Oklahoma, a court ruling is shaking up who may become a tribal citizen. A judge for the Muscogee Nation has ruled that freedmen would be eligible to become full citizens of the nation. The judge cited the 1866 treaty that provided citizenship to all descendants of those listed on the Creek Freedmen Roll. Freedmen, who are the descendants of enslaved people who were owned by tribes, have been fighting for full citizenship within tribes. The current Muscogee Nation Attorney General explained in a statement that the tribe plans to appeal this to the nation's Supreme Court. The same treaty was used within the 2020 McGirt ruling, which confirmed that a majority of Oklahoma was tribal land. The Cherokee Nation is currently one of five tribes that has granted full citizenship to the freedmen. We head now to Washington State, where a man has been convicted for selling fake art. Louis Anthony Rath pleaded guilty to multiple crimes, including violating the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. This makes it illegal to sell any craft, falsely suggesting it was native-made. Rath had been falsely claiming to be a member of the San Carlos Apache tribe when he sold his art in Seattle. He created totem poles, masks, and other carvings that were sold at retail stores throughout the city. He was also found to be in possession of bald and gold eagle parts. Rath was sentenced to two years of probation and 200 hours of community service. This follows a previous conviction of another Seattle-based artist for violating the same act in March. A tribe in California is celebrating a newly installed solar energy system. The Bishop Paiute tribe opened a multifamily solar power system for the tribe's Coyote Mountain apartment. The apartments are designed as an affordable housing and sober living facility. The Bishop Paiute Tribal Council sent a news release that the solar system will save 24 households nearly $500,000 on their energy bills over the lifetime of the system. Funding for the program came from a California agency that provides financial incentives for installing photovoltaic energy systems on multifamily affordable housing. 
The governor's tribal affairs secretary, Christina Snyder, said the project advances the goals of tribal self-determination as well as creating clean energy. The Bishop Paiute tribe has more than a decade of experience delivering solar projects. The project included on-the-job training for tribal citizens. Now to the plains where biologists are facing a severe dilemma in solving an environmental crisis, one that could have serious consequences. ICT's Jack Orleans has more for us. Biologists are in a tough spot to save dwindling bird numbers in one of the most important ecosystems in North America. The grasslands are seeing a huge change in plant life too, and human causes are mostly to blame. Since the 1970s, we've lost about 3 billion birds, right? It's a, it's a huge amount. The grassland represents some of the largest and most diverse patches of land on Turtle Island. However, some species such as the lesser prairie chicken have declined by more than 90%. The decline in coverage has a lot to do with encroachment by trees and the looming climate crisis. Well, as a habitat, you know, the grass, grasslands in North America are the most imperiled. I think that uh, there's an estimated 55 million acres of grasslands from Canada to Mexico. And we've already lost 40% of them. While intensive agriculture has prompted experts to reach out to farmers and ranchers, some of the most tangible effects of climate change are affecting the availability of water in the area, leading to droughts. The techniques that farmers and ranchers used to use to manage their property may be age old, but they must be supplemented with experts' input on preservation and maintenance of the surrounding environment. The good news is, several ranchers and people who work in the area have already been seeing improvements in numbers after a long period of decline. Over the last 20 years, through the changes that we've made, we've seen a huge bump in sharp-tailed grouse. The birds may be able to be preserved for now, but until climate change is properly dealt with, there's no guarantee that any effort in preservation will be successful or just delaying the inevitable. In Phoenix, Arizona, Jack Orleans, ICT News. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Kevin McCarthy has officially become the first Speaker of the House to be kicked out of office in U.S. history. A small group of far-right Republicans, led by Florida Representative Matt Gates, successfully challenged McCarthy's leadership through a 216 to 210 vote. The drama was set when Democrats said they would not bail McCarthy out. Oklahoma Representative Tom Cole, a Chickasaw citizen and chairman of the Rules Committee, said the vote to remove McCarthy would result in chaos. Well, chaos or not, Congress must still fund the government by November 17th. So what's next and how do we make sense of all of this? ICT regular contributor Holly Cook Macaro is the founding principal and president of The Angle, and she is also a board member of Indige Public Media, the parent company that owns ICT and the ICT newscast. We spoke to her earlier this week for answers. Take a look. Let's jump right in here and let's start with the Republicans. Democrats said they did not want to broker what they called a Republican civil war. Do you think that is what we're seeing right now? I definitely think that the fissures within the Republican caucus um, were exposed for all of America yesterday. And what has really, um, it became clear that the ability to um, govern in their own caucus um, is practically impossible. I think we saw that if you look back at John Boehner's frustration when he resigned as Speaker of the House, and those were the Tea Party days, and um, he was really very frustrated with the inability of the caucus to come together, and um, and really, you know, the extremists of of uh, you know wanting things one way and not not even working with their own party much much um, less uh, the other party. So what we're what we're really seeing today is a result of deals cut on day one um, when he passed a rules package, really very much catering and empowering to the um, far right wing of the Republican Party. 
One of the issues that Democrats raised was trust, and we saw McCarthy broke his deal with the president days after agreeing to a solution on the debt limit. And then he also has reached out repeatedly to the most conservative wing of his party on issues like an impeachment hearing for President Joe Biden. Do you think that Democrats can work with any of the GOP alternatives? It's, well, certainly. I think there are um, really experienced um, legislative leaders in the Republican caucus, like like Scalise, like Tom Emmert, like Indian Country Zone, Tom Cole, as you mentioned. Um, but what is really the problem is the set of rules that the party passed on day one when they took over. Well, it wasn't exactly day one; it was in the in the in the first few weeks, but. Before McCarthy could become speaker, he had to agree to a set of rules that empowered, that that allowed one member to bring what um, a motion to vacate, which is what Congressman Matt Gates did yesterday from Florida. And prior to that, it would have taken a, a vote from the entire caucus and would have been the majority leader or the minority leader um, that could do that. But it would have taken a consensus of the caucus. But when you empower just one member to bring that motion to vacate, and you have such a slim margin, it really means that you've taken, you've put, you've put every speaker after McCarthy, no matter how good they are, no matter how trustworthy they are, they are going to be as weak as Speaker McCarthy was yesterday when he lost a vote with just eight of his own caucus voting against him. That that is the foundation and the weakness here. We know that right now it's Wednesday morning we're speaking to one another and there are many names being floated around right now, including former President Donald Trump to potentially be the Speaker of the House. Yes, interestingly, the Constitution doesn't say that you have to be a member of the House to become Speaker. Now, I think it's unlikely that that will happen. Um, Hakeem Jeffries. The Democratic leader has also been floated as Speaker of the House. But as was demonstrated yesterday, there is really not a sense of bipartisanship that I could see even, you know, centrist, moderate Republicans joining with the entire Democratic caucus to elect um, Hakeem Jeffries. And I don't know that um, that former President Donald Trump could could accomplish um, bring that uh, that his election across the finish line either. One thing I do want to note is one of the re and and talking about you know Indian countries role in this if you look back and I, I referred to the that rules package deal that had to be cut but really this began in November when the Repub the, the the Republicans weren't able you know it was expected to be this red wave it was really more of a you know very small a small ripple and so when you only they they won enough seats to take over the house but only with a margin of five votes. And that is because they couldn't take out people uh, like Sharice Davids, member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, who was a top target for Republicans, a frontline, what, what Democrats call frontline. They're, they're um, most vulnerable members in districts that are more conservative. And um, so Sharice Davids really had a lot to do with what happened yesterday because the, it, the elections of 2022 left no wiggle room for, for Speaker McCarthy, either in negotiating the, uh, becoming elected speaker or negotiating any of these bills that really brought um, the motion to vacate from, from Congressman Gates yesterday. As I mentioned earlier, we saw uh, uh, Representative Tom Cole, who is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, give a really impassioned speech there on the House floor yesterday. Do you think there's any scenario in which Tom Cole puts his name out there and maybe becomes the Speaker of the House? There, there's nothing I would like to see more than Tom Cole as Speaker of the House in this Republican majority. Um, Tom Cole, Congressman Cole, is uh, well liked and respected on both sides of the aisle has a demonstrated track record of bipartisanship and 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 a successful legislator. Um, he has, however, shot down any idea of, of running for speaker, and um, probably partly because of the circus we saw yesterday and that vulnerability I mentioned that is built in right now to uh, that really empowers that right wing. He is chair of one of the most powerful committees um, in the House in an environment that he can manage a little better than trying to fight with that entire caucus. So um, I think Indian country would, would greatly benefit if Tom Cole uh, decided to throw his hat in. And who knows? 
right? We don't know if anyone can get elected in this atmosphere, but Tom Cole could be a consensus candidate. Let's all cross our fingers. Holly, we only have about 30 seconds left here. So yes or no, do you think a week from now we will have a Speaker of the House? No. Well, we'll continue. <laughs> <laughs> we'll continue to watch that as always. ICT regular contributor Holly Cook Macaro, thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. A piece of legislation in Congress would reverse the Interior Department's decision to withdraw future oil and gas development around Chaco Canyon National Historical Park. ICT's Mark Trahant spoke to the executive director of the All Pueblo Council of Governors, Taryn Bia, about the issue. Before we take you to that interview, I should note that Taryn Bia is my husband, and I did not have any editorial oversight of this story. So Chaco Canyon represents the epicenter of trade between 800 AD to 1200 AD in uh, North West uh, New Mexico, an important place that is sacred to the 19 Pueblos of New Mexico and one Pueblo of Texas. Unfortunately, that landscape uh, for how sacred it is to the Pueblos is also equally uh, rich in minerals. And over the last 60 years or so, 90% of the federal land surrounding Chaco Culture National Historical Park have been leased for oil and gas development. The last 10% 10, 10 of those federal lands have uh, been in peril uh, for continued oil and gas development. For those reasons, the All Public Council of Governors have been advocating for its protections over the last three decades. And with that being said, um, the, in the last eight years or so, the All Public Council of Governors has, has developed a two-part approach um, to protect Chaco Canyon. First is to seek withdrawal of federal lands and minerals surrounding the park um, in the 10-mile withdrawal area. and. Uh, the second is to seek tribally-led ethnographic studies to proceed all, all other development. In the last three years, uh, we've had the great pleasure of having the Department of Interior consider a administrative withdrawal that completed in June of this past year. It was to uh, make a consideration to withdraw those uh, minerals in a 10-mile in a withdrawal area from, uh, for 20 years, federally removing them. The outcome of that uh, was in the favor of many stakeholders um, that concluded in June of this year uh, with its announcement that the Department of Interior would, would uh, complete that administrative withdrawal process. Unfortunately, some misinformation has circulated around that uh, Department of Interior's administrative withdrawal and it's led to protests uh, and it's led to the introduction of a bill out of Arizona uh, Republicans that would undo all of that work. The All Public Council of Governors has taken action to oppose that resolution coming out of the Republican caucus uh, so that we could protect the necessary measures in order to preserve Chaco Canyon. Some of this misinformation I think is really important because um, when you hear people protesting, they're talking about um, t something t being taken away from them, mm -hmm. when in fact it really is about nothing new as, as I understand it. Yes, Navajo Nation and the Pueblos came together at the urging of local Navajo community members to do something about legacy mineral development on their lands and in their communities. It was born um, out of those discussions between Navajo Nation and the Pueblos that the design of a 10 mile withdrawal area would be uh, made into a concept of a chocolate uh, bill uh, introduced by Senator Tom Udall and others in the New Mexico delegation, which is the topic of debate here today. Uh, the Department of Interior completed its administrative withdrawal after extensive tribal consultation and public input. Um, but the misinformation is whether or not Navajo Nation was ever at the table and whether or not their allottees would uh, see their economic gains loss. There has been a wide ranging level of support on Chaco Canyon and within Navajo Nation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, local communities were at the forefront of addressing this oil and gas legacy within Navajo Nation itself. And they led the charge for big Navajo to uh, take a approach, a pragmatic approach to protecting the landscape. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, Navajo Nation has, steps, uh, has since stepped away from government to government agreements, but we still enjoy the the support from many local communities who are 
asking their nation to be mindful of the legacy oil and gas development. Um, the one, some of those individuals are Mario Atencio. He testified in opposition to this crane bill in the House Natural Resources Committee in July. And many others who have been long calling to reclaim uh, their power against mineral development. And we're hoping that Navajo Nation can come back to a table to assess the, the need to protect sacred sites while also balancing the interests of economic development. I want to switch topics real quick and just ask you um, if the various Pueblos uh, governments are prepared for a government shutdown and how they're basically what steps are being taken now. The All Public Council of Governors has been uh, carefully tracking this dynamic in Congress where Republicans are leading the House and the Democrats are leading the Senate. Earlier this year, um, the biggest issue has been that the Pueblos have been advocating on is the federal trust responsibility, asking Congress, despite their uh, their party, to to respect the federal trust responsibility. When the debt, debt ceiling was being considered in the negotiating table, and now as we think about uh, whether or not the federal government will shut down, public leadership are standing strong to advocate to Congress that there's a federal trust responsibility. We encourage you to respect that as you make your considerations of a, of a budget and that so many of our communities, regardless of your Pueblo or a different tribe, rely on the federal government support um, to, to execute their obligations. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. This next movement started a decade ago to commemorate the experiences of students at a single Canadian residential school. It's now every September 30th, a federal holiday in Canada, focused on healing the legacy of that entire era. It's also now taking root in the United States. ICT's Stuart Huntington has more on what started as and will always be known as Orange Shirt Day. September 30th marks the third annual National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada. It highlights the history and impacts of Canada's residential school system that took Native students from their families and stripped them of their lifeways. The day, marked by marches and gatherings, is also taking root in the United States. The importance is to really shed a light on what happened in this country because it's just not known in the general public it's not taught about, it's just not talked about, people don't know. So taking this day to really spread awareness is important. And it also allows our community to come together and um, support each other as we continue to learn more about what happened in Indian boarding schools and just bring about more truth and awareness. Last year marked a major turning point in the U.S. The Interior Department released its first Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative report. The initiative is designed to determine the scope of the long shrouded system. The truth is coming out more and more, especially this past year. So the more that people are learning the truth, the more it's bringing about emotions in them. And it is about the children, you know, and bringing remembrance of the children in ways of putting little um, baby shoes on the steps of churches or schools or, or anywhere, really, just to bring that awareness. But much remains hidden. Since last year's report, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition has identified more than 100 more Indian boarding schools and the trauma from the schools is difficult to measure. You can almost tie all of our disparities or everything that we're going through as Native people back to Indian boarding schools, from um, low education rates, suicide rates, high poverty rates, um, high health disparity rates. Everything can be tied back to boarding school. Um, it goes deeper than people can even um, imagine without really going into it. It's literally tied to every issue that we experience today. And, and we're still going through it. Um, you'll, you can see on native lands, the, just the trauma that is still living within people, the intergenerational trauma, the intergenerational um, and historical trauma that we carry within our, our genes. 
Just ask Tiana Bill. She went to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, the site of the country's first federal boarding school. She went to bring home the remains of her Puyallup ancestor, Edward Spot, who died at the school in 1896. But the remains in the grave were not Edward's. No one knows if they will ever be located. Don't think that just because, you know, we're living in the 2020s that this trauma is something of the past. Um, because if we don't, if we don't take care of ourselves right now and if we don't address it, then it will never be done. It will follow us into our future. Which is what Orange Shirt Day hopes to prevent. If we, if we start by knowing the truth, then we can start the healing process to, to get through the, this trauma and all, everything that was put in place to be against us as Native people. Reporting from Carbondale, Colorado, Stuart Huntington, ICT News. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.